Welcome to the first program in a series of five dealing with the theme of revolution in Latin America. One of the most frequent aspects treated in news bulletins on Latin America is the violence, which we tend to associate with revolution. We are bombarded with two-minute clips of government troops fighting against guerrillas and are told how, in order to prevent communist infiltration, the United States is forced to help maintain the status quo. By now, we've become immune to the scope of violence. 22,000 people killed in the last 15 months in El Salvador, a country one half the size of Nova Scotia. Perhaps 10,000 disappeared at the hands of the security forces and presumed dead in Chile. The news comes across as a blurred rerun of a rather sordid scenario in which violence, destruction and death predominate. Since we cannot really understand just what is the truth, we simply switch off, dumping these disturbing images in a psychological limbo at the back of our mind and passively watch the fleeting images on the silver screen. During the course of the next five weeks, an attempt will be made to flesh out these cardboard images and explain precisely what has happened, particularly in the last 20 years, in Latin America. Among other things, subsequent programs will examine the historical reasons for this tragic state of affairs, and a study will be provided of revolutions in Mexico, Cuba, and Nicaragua. The objective, then, is to cause viewers to go behind the scenes of our news flashes. This program will serve as an introduction to the present-day reality of Latin America. Perhaps a brief geographical introduction is in order. The population, roughly 370 million, is spread very unevenly throughout this area. The largest country is Brazil, with a population of 120 million, where Portuguese is the official language. All the other countries are lumped together as Spanish America, Really a misnomer, since many of them, for instance Paraguay, Guatemala, and the Andean countries, have an, an Indian majority. Yet common to all are serious problems, injustice, repression, a struggle for human rights, uneven distribution of wealth, and a poor economic climate. Nowhere is this more particularly so than in Central America, the subject of our fifth program, we have just recovered, it seems, from the harrowing scenes of life under General Somoza, when once again we are plunged into a similar plot in El Salvador. The Sandinistas, or followers of Sandino, have been replaced by those who support the teachings of Farabundo Martí, while the government Junta in El Salvador plays the same role as the Somoza dynasty. Moreover, a similar scene is being enacted in nearby Guatemala, so just what is happening? While Central America is giving us most of our Latin American content these days, in the last decade, it was the countries to the south, in what is called the Southern Cone, which used to be the most newsworthy, with the military coup and murder of Chilean President Salvador Allende in 1973, and the 1976 coup in Argentina, and subsequent arrest of the Argentinian Prime Minister. Bolivia being the most coup-ridden country of all of Latin America, with an average of one revolution, or so-called revolution, every nine months during the past 180 years, has more or less exhausted its news potential. The countries of Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil, all ruled by generals, have also been the subject of limited, basically very superficial, media coverage. The northern coast of South America, encompassing the countries of Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, and Panama, the geographical boundary between Central and South America, has not been widely treated by our media. They may be barbaric democracies, 
to use the expression of the Mexican writer Revueltas, but at least they're democracies. And, more to the point, they don't produce the same drama as the other areas. Three other countries deserve brief, if passing, mention. Mexico, which fathered the first major social revolution in 1910. Cuba, which continued and developed this trend with its own radical revolution in 1959. And little Costa Rica, a paradox among Latin American nations because of its rare democratic traditions, far-reaching social programs, and another important first, its status as the only Latin American country without an army. Since this first program is supposed to counterpose myth and reality, let's look first at the image of Latin America, so-called revolutions aside. From the newsworthy political unrest, the general image given is of a colorful, easygoing, picturesque way of life. Images of mariachi bands and intricate weaving, ponchos and marimba music, donkeys and llamas, rum and tequila are constantly flashed before us. The way of life is of course poor. Juan Valdez in the coffee commercial works hard, but of course has a Latin attitude, believes in the manana approach to life, and doesn't subscribe to the Anglo-Saxon work ethic. The natives are friendly, however. They accept our chiclets and don't complain too much. They're happy, we think. Or are they? This, then, is part of the image which is presented to us as we see our TV movies and National Geographic specials. Unfortunately, it's only one facet of the reality of Latin America, as we'll see if we scratch a little beneath the surface. As we study the following statistics, taken mainly from official UN figures, let's try to imagine how we would feel at seeing our families suffering as a result of a lack of amenities we in Canada take for granted. How bad are the conditions in Latin America? When we think of a typical Latin American, we tend to conjure up an image of an Indian. Yet, while we study the noble savage, we should bear in mind some pretty chilling figures. Life expectancy, for instance, in Bolivia, perhaps the most Indian country in Latin America, is only 48 years. Free medical care is something that we in Canada take for granted, something which, with the exception of Costa Rica and Cuba, is not true for any other countries in Latin America. And there are also too few doctors, while there is one doctor in Canada for approximately every 900 people, the figure is one for almost 13,000 in Haiti. Here we see the alternative for millions of Latin Americans, herbs and magical charms to cure everything from flu to cancer. In Chimborazo province, just 60 miles from Ecuador's capital Quito, the traditional Latin American reality is found. 83% of the children there have never seen a doctor, and six out of every 10 children born there die within the first year of life. Daycare service as we know it is of course a luxury. Far more common is to take the child to the field where the parents are working. 52% of the working population is unemployed or underemployed, and 70% of the area's population is without running water, medical attention, or acceptable housing. Of course, added to this poor ratio of doctor to patients is the distance that has to be covered, often by foot or by burro, to actually get to the medical facility, usually situated in the city, and more important, the cost of medical care. This in a continent in which annual per capita income is estimated at 244 US dollars and one half of Latin America's population has an average income of about $122 a year. While the poorest third, more than 100 million people, have an average income of about 70 US dollars, far below any poverty line ever devised. Some health figures illustrate eloquently the desperate plight of Latin America's poor. While the infant mortality rate in the United States is 15 
for every 1,000 live births. This rises to 117 in Honduras and is 10 times greater than the North American average in Bolivia. The type of disease from which many die is also worthy of note. In Guatemala, for instance, almost one in five of the annual deaths are due to enteritis and other diarrheal diseases, something which of course could be avoided with decent housing and reasonable facilities. In 1965, it was estimated that 180 million people, the size of the United States at that time, suffered from a basic lack of protein and other nutrients, and that 50 million people lived at or below starvation levels. For those fortunate enough to possess sufficient funds, medical care is of course widely available. To illustrate the dramatic differences in medical care, here we see two newspaper clippings, one dealing with starving children, while the other advertises medical care for dogs. For a price, a veterinarian will help your dog deliver her puppies, take x-rays of the animal, or even conduct an autopsy when the canine friend passes away. As in all things in Latin America, while money perhaps cannot buy happiness, it can buy virtually everything else. It's very difficult for us in our comfortable Canadian homes to imagine just how desperate the situation is for Latin Americans. Housing, for instance, in the countries to the south is generally pathetic, particularly in the rural areas. A few figures for us to ponder as we see the quaint thatched roofs or picturesque simplicity. According to the most recent UN statistics, only 14% of Bolivian houses have piped water, 33% boast electricity, and only 14% toilet facilities. In neighboring Paraguay, only 25% of urban and 5% of rural Paraguayans have drinking water. Here we see communal cooking facilities in which corn, staple of the Amerindian diet since time immemorial, continues to be eaten as the main source for nutrition. In his excellent account, the Swedish journalist Sven Lindquist notes some disturbing facts. Every year, some 75,000 Peruvians move to Lima seeking a better life. Yet, in the capital, one half of the population lives in condemned housing. Here we see, for instance, the local water supply, laundromat and sewage facilities, as well as watering hole for the local pigs. One of the fundamental solutions to Latin America's problems is, of course, a sound education based on the reality of their respective nations. Unfortunately, the military juntas continue to spend millions after millions on defense, and education is left low on their priority list. For instance, while Cuba spends an impressive 7.9% of its gross domestic product on education, Paraguay spends only 1.4% and Haiti less than 1%. The results of this allocation of funds are of course predictable. Cuba now leads other Latin American nations, while at the bottom of the pile one finds Haiti and El Salvador. More than 83% of Haitians and 48% of Salvadorians have no formal education at all and thus suffer from very high illiteracy rates. If we try to tie all these loose ends together, a very somber picture emerges, the extent of which we in Canada, in the midst of our own economic crisis, may find difficult to conceive. Unemployment, for instance, fluctuates in most Latin American nations, depending on the season, between 20 and 40 percent. Even in oil-rich Mexico, for instance, there are severe problems. These men, lacking the money to advertise, are seen waiting outside the cathedral in Mexico City in the hope that they will be contracted for an afternoon's work. Others in their income by selling chiclets in the rush hour or Indian artifacts to unsuspecting tourists. My favorite is this young entrepreneur who waits by a busy Mexico City intersection for the traffic lights to turn red. Then he squirts water on the windshield, wipes it with a tattered old rag, and calmly asks for 10 pesos. As he told me, since there aren't enough jobs, 
You really have to live by your wits. Sven Lindquist puts the labor situation in perspective when he shows how between 1925 and 1960 the urban labor force grew by 23 million, only 5 million of whom could be absorbed by industry. More important, he shows how there is, of course, no real surplus of labor. The idle capacity of the factories could be used to fill the most elementary needs of the people. The underexploited land on the big estates could be cultivated extensively to feed a hundred million new mouths. Housing, schools, hospitals, roads, dams, all these are still lacking for this new hundred million generation. To try and grasp the extent of this problem alone, let alone the tragic situation of housing, medical care, education, political freedom or land distribution. A few figures. In 1965, Latin America's labor force was 79 million. It's presently 117 million and in a pretty desperate state. By 1995, it will reach 180 million. The situation is chronic now. A relatively rich country like Mexico, for instance, already has a problem of open unemployment, according to the most recent figures, of 9% and underemployment of 47%. That is, 56% are either employed, unemployed or underemployed. What will it be like by the end of this century? If there are already thousands of people scrambling to earn a miserable living on the garbage dumps of Latin America, what will it be like by the year 2000? A further complication to this depressing situation is the actual supply of food. For in these days of cash crops, the difficulties in eking out a daily existence are made worse by the fact that often land that traditionally was used to grow the cheap staples, for example rice, beans and peppers, is increasingly being turned over to such money crops as coffee beans or cotton. As a result, to take the example of a 1971 survey in northeast Brazil, it was seen that the inhabitants of this, the poorest area of the country, had a level of nutrition that was lower than that of slaves working in the same region in 1880. Perhaps more understandable to us is the case of Mexico, from whom we import most of our fresh fruit and vegetables in the long winter months. Well, difficult to believe as this may sound to us, Mexico has fallen into the trap of concentrating on the export of these lucrative cash crops. The end result is that in the first five months of 1980, Mexico had to import herself over $800 million worth of food, mainly maize, beans and wheat, which of course are the staples of the Mexican diet. The total amount of money spent on importing food was expected to be no less than three billion US dollars, fully a third of all imports to Mexico in 1980. Perhaps these reasons in themselves are enough for people, in their sheer desperation, to pick up a machete in a frustrated attempt to do something about the miserable living conditions, scarcity of medical care and decent education. In short, because of the very hard struggle that forcing out a miserable existence involves in Latin America. Added to this, however, is a tremendous problem, the role of the police and armed forces, whose presence, necessary to provide a sound investment climate and keep dissent at a minimum, as at this demonstration, eats up a heavy chunk of most Latin American countries' budgets, Costa Rica accepted. In Paraguay, to take one example, military expenses are estimated as high as 65% of the national budget. As a force of repression, they are tremendously successful, as can be seen from the recent 22,000 deaths in El Salvador, almost all of which have been at the hands of the military and infamous right-wing death squads, according to Amnesty International. Perhaps the best indictment of this cancer of militarism comes from the former vice president of Guatemala, 
Francisco Villagran Kramer. After complaining about the barbaric activities of the military and right-wing death squads, which assassinated some 5,000 people in his country in 1980, including, by the way, 50 professors at the National University and the former foreign, foreign minister, Fuentes Moore, married, by the way, to a Canadian woman. The vice president saw political asylum in the United States. His parting words on the tragic situation of his country sum up everything. There are no political prisoners in Guatemala, only political murders. Given this constant bullying by the forces of law and order, what respect can one have for them? Or the government they shore up so brutally? A further factor that should be borne in mind is the question of land. Just as our own native peoples complain to Ottawa about broken treaty promises, so too the campesinos of Latin America have every reason to feel cheated. Communal land holdings date back centuries before the arrival of Columbus in the so-called New World. Yet, when the Spanish and Portuguese arrived, exercising literally their God-given right to own the land, in addition, of course, to filling their pockets with gold, they quickly expropriated these lands and forced the Indians to slay for them. Land quickly passed to the Iberian landlords with their guns and armies, and the government steadfastly behind them, ready to put down any insurrection of agitators. Since then, not too much has changed, since the native peoples have continually been turfed off land farmed by them for generations, while the new owners lead a fabulously wealthy existence. We see then the continuation of the conquistadores tradition. The end result of this problem is that land and resource ownership continues to become more and more concentrated in a smaller nucleus of a privileged elite. In El Salvador, for example, we read of the 14 families who dominate the political and economic arena, while in Nicaragua, the Somoza family was reputed to own two-thirds of the country's arable land, as well as the top 28 corporations of that country. Little wonder, then, that a Global Mail article of July 21st, 1979, should be entitled, Lopsided Landholding Means More Nicaraguas. This Spanish sign illustrates well the attitude of many wealthy landlords. Translated, it reads, he who has laborers and doesn't stand over them all the time is left without his pants and doesn't have time to believe it. It's interesting because it belongs to a very wealthy landowner friend who also considers himself a radical and who, in fact, has provided decent housing for his laborers, although they have to share the facilities with his horses and pigs. A recent report of the FAO shows that in Latin America, some 7% of the people own 93% of all arable land. Faced with increasingly dismal prospects of making a living in the countryside, these campesinos trudge to the cities, swelling the ranks of the unemployed, living from handout to handout, selling their pride, and living in tin and cardboard shacks in which most Canadians wouldn't allow a dog to live. In Mexico City, it's estimated that 2,000 of these people arrive daily from the countryside. The population of Mexico City continues to grow. Now at 18 million officially, in actual fact, even higher, it is expected to reach 32 million by the year 2000. Brazil's Sao Paulo, which has swollen in size, due of course to the same reasons, will be in second place with an estimated 28 million people. By the year 2000, a veritable time bomb will be awaiting Latin America. An estimated two-thirds of the projected population of 630 million will be crowded into massive urban sprawls, and some 210 million people will be surviving in cardboard shacks with no running water, no electricity, no schools, and no jobs. Can we imagine what that means? What else but revolution can we expect in these conditions? On all sides, then, the people are literally being squeezed. 
in the countryside, they simply cannot compete with larger estancias, or haciendas, which continue to gobble up smaller landholdings, often illegally. Or else they live off tiny parcels of land, trying desperately to provide enough food for their families. Their housing is, of course, substandard. In the city lies the path of promise, but also of broken illusions, since there simply is not enough work for those poor souls already there. It is no wonder, then, that the woman in this fabulous painting by the Mexican muralist Siqueiros, entitled Proletarian Woman, looks so down at the mouth. What future does she have to look forward to? Meanwhile, little has changed for the vast majority of people at the bottom of the social heap. Victims of a rigid social structure, poverty, social injustice, savage exploitation and ignorance, and for the most part denied any significant role in their society, much less the right to its social advances such as housing, health care or education. They represent the dilemma in which Latin America finds itself, one which will not simply disappear. For it's obvious that these hungry mouths, lacking any hope in the future, basically have nothing to lose by fighting against their immoral, unchristian, bloodthirsty dictatorships. Would we do any differently? The aim of this series is to answer the question, why revolution in Latin America? And over the course of the next weeks, we will examine specific revolutionary movements. The first program has attempted to show how shielded we are from the reality of Latin America. The Copacabana Beach in Brazil and Mexico's mariachi bands hide a horrendous reality which we need to examine if we are to understand why people try to break the vicious cycle of underdevelopment. So the next time we're in the local supermarket, let us try and remember that our weekly family grocery bill represents the annual income of some 100 million Latin Americans, a situation which Brazil's Bishop Candido Padin has justly condemned. The situation of the vast majority of Latin Americans, he said, totally contradicts the teachings of Jesus Christ. What we're seeing then is not, inter not an international conspiracy to subvert our free world, but rather an understandable struggle for liberation. Thank you.